Hello everybody, welcome to the second day of the Res developer sessions. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Welcome also to the people who are watching us online. Thank you for watching. Um, next up, we have a genuine industry legend here with us. Um, before, we, before I introduce him, we will have time for some questions uh, at the end of the talk. So please have a think. There'll be a microphone down here. Um, have a think now or while you're watching, and we'll have loads of questions. It'll be wonderful. Uh, without further ado, please welcome Julian Gollop here to talk about his new game, Phoenix Point. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm going to be talking about our new game, as has already been said. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm the original designer of the original XCOM, uh, not the new XCOM. Uh, but Phoenix Point is very much an XCOM-style game, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the differences between old and new XCOM and some of the things which are in common, and some of our design decisions that we're making for Phoenix Point. So one of the interesting things about Phoenix Point is that we have a constantly evolving alien threat. So we've taken the concept, the idea that the aliens are in fact an evolutionary bioorganism uh, that's originated in, on Earth um, uh, from uh, asteroids that have landed on the planet. And they are combining DNA of creatures and humans and creating something horrific, and they're building something, and you don't know what it is. And you, the player, play the role of the Phoenix Project, which is a research organization which has been around for a while, uh, trying to figure out what is going on, what the alien is trying to do, uh, and what's happening. Unfortunately, what happens is that the virus takes over most of the seas of the planet, and um, most of the population of the, of the world are, in fact, killed. Most of them actually just walked into the sea and they've come back as hideous mutants. And this is the situation at the start of the game. We have, as a fundamental part of the game, turn-based tactics and a will-based strategy. So what does that mean? Um, firstly, before I go on to that, I just want to remind you that if you are interested in the game world and the game lore, we are producing a series of books which are called The Briefing. It's a briefing number four, but coming out next week. Our writing team, Jonas and Alan, have really hard at work uh, with myself and the other creative team on building a very detailed game world for you with a lot of backstory. If you sign up to our newsletter on our website, you will get these briefings for free and you can learn some really interesting stuff about the world of Phoenix Point. I won't be talking much more about that now because we're going to get on to the actual game design stuff. So the mutation system um, allows for the aliens to create a, a very interesting variety of stuff. So here are some of the alien concepts for the one of the monster size creatures, and we have some really big, awesome monsters in the game. Uh, different types of mutation here. We've got some, like, these. Are, this is a goo spitter head, believe it or not. This will actually spit goo and trap your soldiers. And one of the aliens' uh, objective is actually to kidnap your soldiers and uh, inject them with virus and turn them into something hideous. Uh, we have versions with guns, we have versions that eject mists. Uh, this particular monster also has spawning type mechanisms. It can spawn crawling creatures, it can spawn flying creatures. Um, and these variations uh, follow on from uh, the actions of the player themselves. So if you fight a particular mutation that is maybe not performing so well and you're beating it, the aliens will then introduce new mutation into that archetype. Um, and if that does well, they produce more of them. Uh, and the other key thing, it would not, of course, be an XCOM-style game without procedurally generated battles. It's a very important part of what we're trying to do. Um, and there are many environments in the game. Many of them are havens where uh, human beings have gathered, uh, the survivors of human civilization. Oh, oops. I've lost my thingy. Uh, okay, so um, so this particular depiction here is a haven. The haven belongs to one of the factions, New Jericho. It's already been under attack. Uh, you can see this in our demo, which is over on the indie room over there. Um, 
But many of the, all of the locations, in fact, are procedurally generation, uh, generated, and you have many different zones inside these, these faction havens, including residential zones, factory zones, and so on, uh, peripheral zones, which is what this is. You have alien structures, you have scavenging sites, which are um, places where you can steal loot from. Uh, and of course, you have your own bases, and uh, you do construct multiple bases in the game, and they can indeed be attacked, and you will fight battles in your bases. And in fact, the, the bases are the only ones which are not procedurally generated, because you, as the player, create the base, you design the layout, very much as in the original XCOM, uh, and the, the base layout that you construct will be the one that you will have to fight in when the aliens come for you. So to talk about the strategic layer, um, what we have here is something very reminiscent of the Geoscape in the original XCOM game. You have a rotating, spinny globe. However, there are some very significant uh, differences here. So what we have is a world populated by multiple human factions, uh, independent havens, alien structures, um, and you have to explore the world at the start of the game. And one of the first things you have to do is make contact with other human survivors, when you make contact with one of the factions, you will then um, gain some interesting access to some of their technology and uh, some of their experiences and so on. So you, you explore, you reach out, you find and develop your forces. Um, meanwhile, an alien mist is encroaching across the land and um, anything that comes within the mist will be uh, liable to be attacked. So the Geoscape system runs on a real-time simulation of the world, and everything is simulated in this world, so the factions are under control of an AI, they're trying to build their factions, build their defenses, do their own research. Each faction has their own tech tree, um, they have their own soldier classes, they have their own ideology, they have their own agenda, and interestingly, they have their own solution to the alien menaces, menace, um, which means there are actually multiple possible endings to the game and at least three of those endings depend very much on the three different factions in the game. <clears throat> so the Havens, so um, as I explained earlier, most of the human population is now um, living in these Havens, so most of the surrounding area is now becoming much more um, desolated and alien infected as the aliens start to move from the sea to the land. These tend to be very uh, well defended areas and um, each of the three main factions has their own havens. So just to introduce the human factions. So we have three factions in the game. Uh, Disciples of Anu, who are an alien worshipping cult, and they've figured out a way to um, modify and control the alien mutation system and use it for their own purposes, which they dress up in religious terms. They're trying to perfect the human body, and they are under the leadership of the Exalted, which is their sort of religious head. Then we have this faction, New Jericho, and New Jericho is headed up by this guy, Tobias West. This is a much more militaristic faction. They specialize in robotics and heavy weapons, and we'll be showing these guys in the demo. Um, finally, we have Synedrion, which is a sort of anarchist, sort of uh, ecological cult, which is um, uh, have very advanced technology, but they're not so interested in using it to just fight aliens. They want to create a new civilization amidst the ruins of the old. And you'll be having relationships with these factions, um, you'll be doing missions for them, you'll be trading from them, but you can also just go into their havens and steal stuff from them. You can steal their tech, their resources, their vehicles. Uh, so you can play the game different ways, although you will probably have to at least ally to some extent with one of the factions to, to actually make reasonable progress in the game. Um, so just to talk a little bit about soldier classes. So um, each faction has their own set of soldier classes which represent that faction's approach to warfare and combat. Um, so New Jericho have as a base these three, four classes, sniper, technician, which is essentially a guy with robotic arms that can do all kinds of stuff like repairing uh, limbs, uh, hacking technology and stuff like that. Uh, the Assault, which is a very agile um, soldier, and the Heavy, the Heavy is the, the, the elite of New Jericho, very heavily power armoured. He has most of the technology goes into to these guys. Um, and we have in our demo today, we have got the Sniper, the Assault, and the Heavy. The technician will be coming soon. So the interesting thing from the player's point of view is that he can uh, 
recruits these soldiers from these other factions, and he can actually mix and match a lot of their class technology, their armors, their weapons, uh, and the player is, allow uh, is allowed to create characters which derive from these other uh, classes, um, but are not constrained by them. So essentially we have sort of like a multi-classing system in the game. And part of the customization of your soldiers is based on the, the idea that you can also mix and match different armor types, uh, different helmet types, different weapons. You are not constrained. And basically the classes in Phoenix Point represent a skill, a skill tree, a, um, uh, sort of a, a set of, um, uh, sort of skill choices that the player can make for his characters and is not constrained by one particular class. So, um, Let's head over to demo and we'll explain a little bit about some of the core uh, mechanics in the game. <clears throat> Just get it started. So one of the first things that people say to us when they see is, well, it looks like New XCOM. And I, we have actually taken some very important aspects of what the New XCOM, which is a fantastic game in terms of presentation interface and how the action is conveyed to the player. Um, but for those of you out there who were screaming at us saying, where are my time units? I want my time units back. I will now show you exactly how this works. So uh, for example, I'm just going to switch to another character. So let's here take the sniper guy. So he's got a, a sniper weapon. So the blue zone tells me where I can move and shoot. And the orange zone is my move only zone. But if I switch to my pistol, which is a much more agile weapon, you'll notice I've got a much bigger movement range. And that's because firing a pistol costs less action points or time units, if you prefer. So we use this representation, uh, which although it's similar to the new XCOM, actually underlying there is, in fact, a sort of time unit system. So I'll just advance some of my characters a bit and I'll explain a little bit more. Bring them up to here. Spotted a crab man. Just gonna bring these guys up a little bit behind. Um, again, as you notice, the heavy has got a very uh, uh, cumbersome weapon. You can't move very far and shoot it. In fact, his, his movement overall is restricted because he's encumbered. He's quite heavily loaded. And the other thing we'll notice about this weapon wheel, so we've got these three different items here. So these are like your ready items. Uh, we will actually have a full inventory system, which is, is in fact working in the game, but it's not currently present in this particular demo. So the ready items you can swap without costing any action points. But if you want to change your weapon for something else in your, your backpack or something else you're carrying on your body, you will have to go into the inventory management to change that. So let's just switch back to his sniper gun. And you'll notice that the interface updates depending on which weapon you've selected. So I'm going to advance him up to here. Let's just bring this guy up. Actually, I probably don't need him, but... So we'll switch to the aliens and see what they do. The crabmen have got their own language, by the way. I don't know exactly what it is they're saying, but it, it does actually mean something according to our sound designer. So these are, these are melee-oriented. Uh, creatures. Um, they're deploying a shield. Actually, I've got three of them deploying shields at me, which is interesting. Okay, let's get my sniper guy, and I will demonstrate something. So again, the interface is kind of similar to the new XCOM in some ways. But at this point, I'll try and explain some differences. So you've still got this over-the-shoulder view. But one thing I can do is go into a sort of first-person mode. And here, I can highlight the different body parts that I can actually shoot at. And because I've got a sniper gun, so this red circle here represents where all my shots are going to fall. 
And because it's a very accurate weapon, I can actually reliably target, for example, this crab man's legs. Uh, I could go for his shield, but his shield has a lot of armor. You can see up here, he's got four armor and shield, only likely to do, um, like, take half his health away from that. If I shoot his legs, I might be able to cripple him. Again, this body part targeting is an important part of the game. Um, is even more important when we see the big monsters. But anyway, just for the sake of demonstration, I'll show you if I can just hit his legs, see if I can cripple him, rather than go for his shield. So left leg disabled, he's got one bleed, seven damage. That was actually a good move from my part. Uh, so even there, you've got a, a major, major distinction with perhaps how, say, the new XCOM works, and a much more refined uh, approach also compared to the old XCOM. Now, if I shoot with my assault guy, um, he's a lot less accurate, and if I go into the first person mode here, um, it's a bit less reliable for me to target his leg. So all of my shots will fall within the red circle, but you can see there is a significant gap there. I'm probably not going to make it. Um, and one thing you may have noticed on this interface is that actually there are no percentages displayed whatsoever. Uh, from the point of view of the player, he has to judge his accuracy based if he wants to do it um, uh, in detail, he has to do it based on the size of this circle. Um, you do have a damage readout here. Um, the interesting thing um, from the assault soldier's point of view is that he can do absolutely no damage to the crabman's shell, shell uh, shield, rather, I should say. Um, so this can be a completely wasted shot. We have, we have an estimated damage readout. If I can sh highlight his legs, then I might be able to... There's a possibility that I can disable his legs. Let's just have a go. I should move it just a little bit now. OK. Yes, I did it. So left leg disable. So in this particular case, I, I did the right thing. Uh, Kremlin lost quite a bit of health. He's bleeding and so on. Um, so this is... I guess one of our main experiments with the core mechanics and one of the main divergences, I guess, with the new XCOM is that um, Phoenix Point is a definitely more simulation-oriented in terms of how we're simulating the environment, the ballistics, and so on. Uh, similarly, at the strategic level, it's also much more simulation-oriented. Um, some very strong elements of 4X games going into our strategic level of the game itself. Um, so this is one of the ways by which we are forging a slightly different path for, for Phoenix Point. OK, I'm not going to demonstrate too much more on the demo now. If you want to have a go at it yourselves, um, please head over to our stand in the indie area. We've got four machines there. You can have a go on the, on the game. Um, for our backers, we have our first backer build, which is coming at the end of April. And this is for those of you who have backed at the digital luxury level uh, of Phoenix Point, um, and you'll be able to get your hands on uh, early versions of the game. So OK, let's switch back to the presentation. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I, I hope you've got some interesting questions to, to ask me. I'll do my best to answer them. And uh, who wishes to come first? So do do come on up, don't, don't be shy, come and ask a question. Um, Julian, you mentioned something earlier um, about your soldiers maybe being taken. Yes. Uh, by, so am I right in thinking I could put lots of time and effort into a soldier, then they could be pinched by the aliens and used against me? Uh, yeah, this is correct. One of the things the aliens try to do is abduct your own soldiers, I and mean, if they do that, they can um, <laughs> interrogate them, inject them with viruses, and figure out the location of your base and they will become mutated, and that mutation will head back to your base and actually start attacking you. It's, this is uh, one thing, one surprise that you have to watch out for in the game. Right, so, uh, you know, it, it could be like my star player, and then they could just... It could be, yes, yes. It will be a bit of a shock to see your, your star player. Maybe you, you've given him the name of your best friend, and you have to tell your <laughs> best friend that he's turned over to the alien side, and uh, you had to kill him, <laughs> unfortunately. Oh, well, yeah. Because <laughs> okay. uh, he invaded your base. But yes, so... Um, uh, you can do the same to the aliens, by the way. So if you capture aliens uh, alive, you can, um, given the right technology, interrogate them and find out where their structures are and where their bases are and go for them. Uh, the big monsters that appear in the game are actually persistent characters as well. So if you find their location, even though you might encounter them in a number of battles, 
but you find their lair and you go there and you can find the monster there and actually dispatch it. Fantastic. Okay, uh, first question, please. Hello, thank you. My question is, when you're prototyping the combat, how do you make sure it's fun before you invest too much kind of graphics into it, like in a gray boxing sort of thing? Uh, well, it's done concurrently. Okay. So we've actually gone through several prototypes. Uh, our very, very early prototype was, was literally gray boxes and stuff, but it worked quite differently to this one. Um, and we, we went through a version which was completely deterministic, for example, interestingly, uh, which has completely deterministic damage concepts and stuff. Um, this is probably our actual third major iteration of the combat system, uh, which I'm definitely much more happy with because it has much more of a feeling of, you know, that you're in a sort of real combat. Um, and the, the fact that you've got realistic ballistics and distribution of bullets and stuff makes it... You, we, I think we have, to a large extent, avoided the, the curse of, I guess, XCOM games where you've got this RNG problem, which a lot of people complain about. Some people are happy with RNGs, some people are not. Um, and we're trying to find a solution which doesn't have that problem in the game. Thank you. You could, you could always have loot boxes, don't you? Don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is always that option. Uh, hi. Um, what's your, what's going to be your approach on the whole modding scene? For example, like XCOM 2, they had the Steam Workshop. And yes. That was, had really high reception. What's, uh, what's your plan with Phoenix Point on that regard? So our plan for modding is we will be supporting it, but not with the initial release of the game. Uh, it's actually quite a lot of work to do that. And we don't, we don't have quite the resources that the XCOM 2 team had um, to sort of provide everything that we're getting. Our, our focus really is in, in, in making a really good quality experience for the player on release that is bug-free and you know, works well and smoothly on many machines. Um, modding uh, will definitely come after that. We have, we've got a lot of long-term plans to support the game in many different ways, uh, beyond just modding and even beyond just DLC. So um, it is interesting. One of the things about modding, though, is that it tends to um, uh, it, it tends to appeal only to a minority of the original players. Um, there have been obviously very famous cases where modding has resulted in a whole new genre of game being created, um, as with you know Dota, for example. Um, but with XCOM 2, it, it's, it tends to be a much more smaller but focused community. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next question, please. Hi there. Um, it's clear that you and the team have put a lot of effort into making sure there's a considerable variety of tactics and uh, different class builds and, and so on that go into the game to make the, the, the experience interesting to the player. Um, I think the frustration I have with some of the, um, the later iterations of XCOM, um, more recent XCOMs, has been that once a strong build has been discovered, there's a temptation to kind of spam that um, it tends to be strong against yeah. all, all comers. There are certain builds that are just strong against everything. Um, I'm yep. wondering if, apart from the adaptation system of the aliens, if you put any kind of uh, systems to encourage the player to play um, in a kind of varied way, rather than just taking this kind of spam approach. Yes. Uh, well, actually, the mutation system is fundamental to, to uh, solving that particular problem. Um, now, there are a huge number of combinations of different creatures that could be in Phoenix Point, and it's just massive. Uh, the, the actual mutation system has a, has a random element to it. So if you um, uh, are very successful in battles where they're deploying lots of these crab men with the, you know, say, the melee versions of these crab men or whatever, um, the, uh, the aliens would mutate the crab men, but they do it in a random way. They think, OK, well, we've got to mutate this. We'll, do random, and we'll just throw it into the battle to see what happens. Uh, and if that particular mutation starts to work well, they produce more of them. Um, but the random element means that you don't know exactly what you're going to get when, you, uh, when they go through the mutation process. Um, but what you do know is that you will be facing something different, that you'll have to come up with some different way to counteract some of the mutations that you see. Uh, and this is basically how it will work. Thank you. Julian, how do, how do uh, aliens go through the mutation process? Like, what kicks it off? What triggers it? And does that mean that, I think I understand, does that mean that this, we might 
fight the same enemy next time, but they might be slightly different because they've grown another head or something? Or um, how, does it, how does it work? How does it trigger? Uh, well, it's triggered primarily through how well those, those archetypes are doing in battle. Okay. This is the primary mechanism they do it. Um, but also, when um, well, an alien lair or nest is first created, they, they start with a, uh, a mutation there which is randomly selected. Um, it means in different parts of the world, you'll come, up, you'll come across different types of aliens as well. This also is a strong geographical factor to it. Um, but it, it's, uh, the other thing that triggers new versions of aliens coming along, new archetypes, is the fact that the aliens are building these structures, they're building bigger structures, and you, we actually have some really huge aliens coming along at the later yeah. stages of the game. Uh, so that's also another factor, that the general alien progress towards their goal will create new mutations as well. Fantastic. Um, next question, please. Hi. Um, the new XCOM adjusts difficulty by changing the probabilities to hit and by lengthening the game. I'm yes. wondering, given that you don't have that kind of random factor, what is your approach going to be to scaling difficulty up and down? Uh, that's a good question, uh, to which I, I do not have a definitive answer <laughs> to yet. I mean, it's something that I've been considering. And again, it goes back partly to, to the mutation system as to how how often the aliens will go through that process um, and to, uh, to what extent they react to the player and when they find a good mutation, how quickly they deploy those. Uh, this is one of the main things that I've been thinking of to, to sort of um, uh, affect the difficulty level as such. The other thing is also the situation of the human factions as to how, um, how active and how smart they're being at the strategic level. So the other strategic level of difficulty is also important. So these are the, the main things that I'm thinking of at the moment. We won't be doing things like adjusting base stats of, of uh, aliens or, or your characters or anything, no. Would you be separating those two difficulties, tactical and strategic? Um, <laughs> Well, they're related, <laughs> of course, uh, but yes. So um, the challenge at the strategic level um, will be much more about the um, relationship with the factions, the diplomacy, and what the factions themselves do. So in a more difficult version of this world, the, the factions may well be generally more hostile and more aggressive, for example. Um, we, we really haven't got very far on that particular part of the game, but for sure there will be, there will be systems both at a strategic and tactical level that affect difficulty. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, next question, please. Hi. Uh, um, so it's been a long time since you worked on uh, the original XCOMs <laughs> uh, to now. And I just wondered, how did you go about sitting down to start designing a new game in that sort of uh, space? And also, how has your, um, the games that you've worked on since in your career influenced um, making a similar game, but in 2018, as opposed to back, back in the day? Right, right. So how did I come about uh, the design of Phoenix Point? Well, th there's no doubt the influence of the original XCOM was, was very strong, but also, uh, to some extent, XCOM Apocalypse. I don't know how many people have actually played that. Actually, show of hands, how many people played XCOM Apocalypse? Yeah, so there's a few, but a small number. So that was a minority build <laughs> XCOM game. So XCOM Apocalypse was very interesting because it had these multiple corporations and factions, and you could have three-way fights, four-way fights at the strategic level, which was very interesting. So there were some ideas there which uh, I definitely wanted to develop. Um, and I guess the other thing from, from, the, from the basic premise and setting and story point of view, having involving um, like Jonas and Alan on the writing side has been really very interesting to come up with uh, an interesting world for the game to inhabit. Um, uh, and that was also a good starting point for where we wanted. That's sort of where the whole mutation evolution system was coming from. Uh, and also in response to, I mean, David, my co-founder sitting down here, he wanted... <laughs> He wanted uh, um, XCOM with zombies, I think was the first one. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, zombies, uh, I know zombies are very popular, but let's think of something which is, which is about this, you know, um, disfigurement of humanity through some kind of evolution process. 
um, and then introducing something more and more alien coming in. So these are some of the ideas that we come across. But so the original XCOM is, is a big influence. And I, actually, my brother Nick is sitting down here. He was my co-creator on the original XCOM. Um, and we also wanted to get back to that sense of horror and just really unpleasant surprises that you could get, like in the original XCOM with the chrysalids, for example. Um, so we're trying to, trying to direct the art style towards that as well. It's, it's much more of a uh, um, sci-fi, horror, terror, un fear of the unknown type thing. Um, uh, and that's really driven a lot of where we decisions we're making, even on the, the game design side. Actually, what's the second part of your question? <laughs> uh, what, uh, in terms of um, the games you've worked on since? since oh, uh, what's the games you've worked on yeah. since? How have they influenced yeah, what I've done? Yeah, yeah. Um, or, or is well, it more the sort of people you're working with then, if you're talking about sort of writing and uh, things like that? Yes, I mean, games I've worked on since, I mean, I have followed up on... Uh, so, for example, we did Laser Score Nemesis, which had a phased real-time system, uh, which is very interesting. Um, but I didn't consider that for Phoenix Point. And, you know, we'd, I've done a number of games which have had tactical combat. Um, I, I don't think any of them, uh, I could say, has been a major step forwards in terms of my, my thinking on, on, on uh, where Phoenix Point is going. I think we came to Phoenix Point with the, with the idea that um, you know, there, there is something about the original which is still missing. Um, there was something in XCOM Apocalypse which was not finished. Uh, and there was something in you know, also the whole Lovecraftian cosmic horror thing that I, I really wanted to, to get involved in the game as well. Um, so that, these are the main things. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got time for uh, one more question. I like how you've got some... Uh, some quite Stranger Things music in there as well. <laughs> yes. Uh, next question, please. Hello. Uh, it's always been a tactical combat in XCOM and most of your past games. I was wondering, it, it sounds like you want to introduce more of a strategic element, uh, a strategic layer in yes. Phoenix Point. What have you done differently in your design approach to introduce uh, more st uh, strategy? As opposed to just tactics. Well, um, yes, good question. So, I, I guess there's an influence from 4X games, a very strong influence. I mean, um, some of the early 4X games which I really liked, you know, like Master of Orion and Master of Magic and so on, even some modern day ones, which had um, this idea that there are intelligently controlled factions in the game that have something distinct about them. Um, also, the idea of exploration in a world which, uh, although it has some familiarity, is in fact completely unknown to you at the start of the game here in Phoenix Point. Mm -hmm. um, playing Stellaris a bit, actually, also, it was a real-time strategy game. So, the, I guess the idea that there are intelligent agents in this world, mm -hmm. uh, actually not just the aliens, there are say, these other three, three human factions, there are independent havens, independent characters, uh, there's independent agents all trying to do their own stuff, and if you as a player did nothing, um, things would still happen. Unfortunately, the aliens would win, but uh, <laughs> without your intervention. But, you know, the things would still happen. H humanity would still fight. The idea that you're, you're in a sort of living, breathing world type situation rather than just something that's on a linear path or only reacts to what you do. Uh, was uh, Apocalypse much inspiration in that? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, what we tried to do in XCOM Apocalypse was create a, a world in, in which, even though it was just only one city, where you had these radically different corporations. And, you know, for example, corporations that made, manufactured the weapons. I mean, if you, you could raid them, you could piss them off, and they'd attack you. Um, but if they had financial problems, you wouldn't be able to buy weapons from them, and so on. It's kind of, these kind of interactions I, I really like. So... Again, Phoenix Point has more of a simulation orientation than um, the new XCOMs. And its, it's foundation is very firmly on uh, the, the stuff that we were doing with the original XCOM and XCOM Apocalypse. Uh, and some of my experiences playing 4X games as well. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, and one final question. No. Uh, you mentioned that the um, backers will be able to play the yeah. game uh, this month. And of course, you can play the game today. 
uh, on the res show floor. But what about everyone else? When can they? When will they? So be able to play the uh, our planned release date is uh, end of 2018, and it will be available for PC, Mac, and Linux, by the way. Um, and uh, the, say the backer builds, which we're starting to release this April, every two months we'll we'll update that for our backers, and they will be able to get a inside track on what's happening with the game and development and so on. So. Um, if you're interested, please join us for the ride. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Julian Gollop.